I'm Clay Smith, and uh, we're here today talking to Mr. Larry Woody about his experiences in journalism and uh, kind of get some feedback from him um, about his experience and uh, what he's done in the journalism field in Nashville. So I want to start off and ask you um, if you might could give us kind of a brief history of your, your work experience with journalism. Yeah, Clay, I started with the Tennessee in the fall of 66. I was a part-time student at Belmont. I'd gone a couple of years to a junior college. And I actually did it round about. I got a job at the Tennessean, and, and then I had to find a, uh, a, a a college to attend. So I got my job at the Tennessean, and then looked around town for a college and uh, found Belmont. So I finished up at Belmont, but I worked part-time for the Tennessean for two years while I was a part-timer at Belmont. The uh, Army borrowed me for a couple of years. I was a combat correspondent in Vietnam for one year in 1969, and after I survived that, I came back and got my job back full-time at the Tennessean. Was there full time until uh, four years ago, four and a half years ago, and I took an early retirement to Tennessee. And the Gannett Corporation was offering some early retirement packages to some of us old timers, and uh, so I decided to go ahead and take it and pursue some other things. I still do some some freelance work, some magazine work. Uh, I work. Uh, I, I write a syndicated newspaper column, outdoors column that's carried in some area papers, Lebanon, Mount Juliet, and Hartsville. And so I do enough to, to keep busy. I still enjoy writing, particularly the outdoor writing and uh, environmental writing, conservation, that kind of thing. So as I say, I, I still keep my hand in it with magazine work and a, and a syndicated newspaper column. But at least I don't have to fight the uh, the daily deadlines right. and, the, uh, <laughs> and the pressures that I did for about 40 years at the working for a morning paper. Okay, great. Um, when you think back, um, when, when you sort of started thinking about the Tennessee and, and working, what, what really inspired you to say, I want to be a, I want to write? On uh, Clay, I'd always wanted to be a writer, uh, and newspapers had fascinated me. When I was a little kid growing up in Crossville, we had a, a, a weekly paper, the Crossville Chronicle. It came on Thursdays. It was printed on Wednesday nights. came on Thursdays. And I, w I would look forward for, to the paper so much that I would watch for the mailman coming on Thursday, and when the mail ran on Thursday, I would go out to the mailbox and get the Crossville Chronicle out and read it uh, pay, cover to cover, page by page. And when I got I entered high school, I worked for the Chronicle as a part-timer in high school. That was actually my first newspaper job working for the Crossville Chronicle as kind of a, a general go-friend, write some old bits and just kind of help out, out around the Chronicle office. But to answer your question, I, I've been intrigued by newspapers all my life, and as a kid, uh, Clay, I could never understand how they could get those lines of type to, 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 to come <laughs> right. so perfectly right on, on the right-hand column of type. But uh, I, I've been intrigued by, by writing in general and newspapers in particular all my life. Okay. Um, when you think about your, your kind of the, the width of your career, who, who do you think influenced you a lot during while you were a, a writer? Well, there, there are some obscure people like a guy named Ed Zern, Okay. who wrote, uh, as a magazine writer, kind of a humorist outdoors uh, writer. Robert Ruark, you may have heard of Robert Ruark, he's kind of a latter-day Ernest Hemingway. He's sort of a, as I say, sort of my generation it's Hemingway. Uh, Corey Ford, he was another kind of obscure writer, but he's a, a, an excellent writer. But probably Ed Zern, Corey Ford, Robert Ruark, some of those guys, and then to the traditionalists, as I say, I was, I was a, a Hemingway fan. I was an Ernest Hemingway fan, and a bit of background, that's why I actually volunteered for Vietnam to be a combat correspondent, because I thought I was going to be our generation's <laughs> Ernest Hemingway, and I only regretted that for about 365 <laughs> days every day for, for a year. But uh, those are some of uh, my, my bigger influences, I think. Okay. And then, uh, uh, more modernly, people, uh, claim, and again, your generation probably, unfortunately, doesn't re remember great writers like Freddie Russell. Mr. Russell, Fred Russell, who was a columnist at the uh, Nashville Banner. My old sports editor, Raymond Johnson, who hired me at the Tennessee, and a wonderful old sports writer, and kind of in the Grantland Rice tradition. And John Bibb, a sports editor who was, you know, at the Tennessee until his death about uh, 10 years ago. And some of those more contemporary people, uh, Frank DeFord, a wonderful writer of Sports Illustrated, he was an influence. Frank's still writing, and he's an excellent, excellent writer. But some of those guys in the sports profession, uh, Clay, were tremendous influences on me. Okay. Um, when you think about you know your, your early years uh, with the with in Crossville and also at the at the Tennessean, um, what are some of the most important things? Kind of the the quick lessons you learned uh, right at the bat about how to report news and. Right. I remember John Bibb was a, I never took any, I wasn't a journalism major per se, I took some journalism courses, but I learned more journalism 
on-the-job training at the Tennessean, and John Bibb was an excellent uh, teacher. And he always said, first of all, get the names right. He said, now you may you may write a hundred little stories. You may take, you know, fifteen or twenty basketball games a night, and you may type up three hundred names, and you're typing those up. But up to every one of those, that name's special. He said, in the morning, a mom, dad, uncle, aunt, grandmother's going to pick up the paper, and the most important thing you write in the morning is going to be that one paragraph that's got Timmy Jones or Mary Ann Smith scored six points last night for so-and-so's basketball team. Bill was a sticker for that. Get the names right. Obviously get the information right. Uh, but that I'll never forget those those messages. Bill said, you don't know how, how many how, don't get too don't never get casual about names because again the smallest story in the newspaper is going to be the biggest story not of the year for those people whose names are mentioned in there. So those things like that play just a stickler for accuracy and don't get casual, don't get careless, don't say, man, I, this is the 15th story I've written today because somebody somewhere is going to buy that paper the next morning and that's going to be the most right. important story in the, in the newspaper that year. So the, little, little lessons like that, get, get it right, you know, the old newspaper saying, get it first, but get it right, first mm -hmm. get it right, and uh, that was hammered into us. Also, John Sigenthaler, I'm sure you know John Sigenthaler, he was a uh, a, a wonderful teacher, uh, had, a, had a tremendous influence on, on me and everybody else at the Tennessee. And, and John Sigenthaler, you know, we, we took Sig, or still take him for granted here in Nashville, but when you travel around the country, John Sigenthaler is one of the most prominent journalists in, you know, in the nation. And here in Nashville, we're get, we got used to reading, you know, Sigenthaler's editorials in the Tennessee and see him around town speaking at different events and functions and civic groups. And we forget that we've got a you know, a, a, a journalism jewel right here in her backyard in John Sigenthaler, and to have worked under him and studied under him and occasionally been chewed out by him <laughs> at the Tennessee, and, you know, it's, it's you know, that, that was the best journalism class anybody could attend, working for people like John Bibb and John Sigenthaler. And, and those little lessons that they hammered into us play every day, every day, and if you make a mistake, learn from it, don't make it again. Um, those are the best lessons a journalism student could ever could ever have. Excellent. Um, uh, when you think back, now I know you've covered a lot of different stories, so this may be a little bit difficult question, but um, if you had to think of all your stories and assignments that you've been on, is there one that particularly sticks out that that's memorable and that you were that you were proud of that you're uh, that you reported? I enjoy covering NASCAR racing, stock car racing. That was. In, in the early days, particularly, this kind of the, the, the cowboys of sport. They were sort of a, a non-mainstream sport, NASCAR racing at the time, but these drivers, these rough, tough, semi-converted moonshine runners, they were always intriguing, I thought. And again, the mainstream media back when I began covering NASCAR in the early 70s, uh, the mainstream media didn't cover them that well, so it was sort of an unmined you know, source of, of great stories and great material because television didn't cover them. And man, we had this you know, these wild and crazy guys, <laughs> Richard Petty, Kelly Arborough, my buddy Darrell Waltrip in Nashville, at, at Cuckoo Marlin, who was as crazy as his name sounded. And that, that was so much fun, traveling around and watching those guys, and they didn't race for a lot of money. Back in those days, there wasn't a lot of money. That, that, was, that was fun. That was intriguing. And to make it even more fun, a, a friend of mine played Joe Caldwell, who was a sports writer at the Nashville Banner. Joe also covered... Uh, NASCAR racing and we covered the Ohio Valley Conference football and basketball and so Joe and I would travel together to stock car races and to basketball games around the country and that was fun to travel with someone that's kind of amusing play at the time of course Joe wrote for the banner I wrote for the Tennessee and we were arch rivals but best friends <laughs> so when we go to a stock car race or a football game or a basketball game Joe would sneak around and try to get a scoop for the next afternoon's <laughs> banner. I would sneak around and try to scoop him. <laughs> you know, trying to keep it from each other. Trying to keep each other from finding out what story we were working on. So kind of amusing. But those were good days. They were fun days. And and I'm afraid, uh, Clay, they're, they're, those days are gone. I just don't believe those old, I believe the old newspaper era is gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's kind of something we've, we've talked a little bit about. Um, and... Uh, We'll kind of get to a little bit later too, but while while we've touched on it, um, what what do you see? Uh, what why do you think that? I mean, obviously the internet plays a lot into that, I, I'm sure, but um, what do you think uh, as far as journalism changing in that way? Do you think this is is good, or do you what do you, what are your opinions? Well, on that? obviously, for as an old print guy who's been in it for half a century, I think it's bad. It breaks my heart to see where print journalism for newspapers particularly have come today. 
part it, they were caught in a perfect storm. Uh, in the old days, when I started writing for the, came to work for the Tennessee and play in the late 60s, early 70s, the Nashville television stations would, their, their 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock news consisted of reading the, that morning's Tennessee and an afternoon's banner. Television simply reported, for the most part, the stories that ran in the paper. It's come full cycle. Now, if you watch the 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock news, the, the paper almost reprints what was on the news the night before. As I say, it's come full cycle and you got to credit television because in the old days they didn't get out and hustle and break stories and do investigative reporting. They basically rewrote the, 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 the Tennessee and the banner. Now their news staffs do such a good job. They get out, they report, they break news, they, you know, they do a tremendous job and so it's come full cycle. They used to copy us, now the, we, the print media, copies them and I think the internet's a crutch, Clay. I think I think a lot of newspaper reporters, editors, and publishers use the internet as a crutch for lazy journalism. I still think there's room for print media if they'll get back to what they used to do in the old days in the 30s and 40s, the, the front page era, the famous mm -hmm. movie front page. If you'll go out and you'll get scoops and you'll break stories, people read the newspapers. John Sigenthaler used to say, "This is not complicated. Go out." find stories that people want to read and put them in the newspaper. People will buy the newspaper the next day to read the stories and it's so simple, but for somewhere along the line they got away from it. Again, part of it was television, news, doing such a good job. The advent of 24-hour cable, you know, ESPN from CNN, Fox News channels, 24-hour sports and news. Then the internet, you know, another broadside from the internet where you've got instant news and sports just by clicking a button. But I still think, Clay, that the newspapers, a lot of them, use that as a crutch because they say, well, man, we, we can't break stories, so they don't get out and hustle and try to get those scoops anymore. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had this debate at the Tennessee when I was there, uh, one of our editors announced that we would no longer hold stories. Uh, initially, when the internet came out, with the policy was if we got a good breaking story, if we find out the mayor is going to resign in the morning amid a scandal, we would sit on that story, and the next morning the newspaper headline would be mayor to resign today amid scandal. Mm -hmm. At some point, the, a, a decision was made that we don't hold stories. We put them on, uh, on, on the website, on the Tennessee website in my case. And so my question was, or statement was, we'll never have another scoop because in effect we're scooping ourselves. If we find out the mayor is going to resign tomorrow, we put it on the Tennessee and website, then channel 2, 4, 5, and 17 yeah, will read it, and they'll have it splashed all over it, their 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock news, and then the morning when the Tennessean comes out, and, the, and the story who, the reporter who found out about the story originally, he's going to be scooped by his own story. Right, so yeah. I thought that was a bad, bad decision by the newspapers. I still think it was a... I, I, I think it's a terrible decision now. If, you find, if you've got a scoop, sit on it, and that way you give newspaper readers a reason to buy the paper the next morning. But right now, Clay, there's not much news in a newspaper. It's all, mm -hmm. Newspaper's almost an oxymoron. It's a paper, but it doesn't have any news in it. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and then the same people who make these decisions, the editors and publishers, they sit around and they, they have meetings and wonder why nobody's reading the paper. The reason they aren't reading the newspaper is because there's nothing in there to read. They've, mm -hmm. they've seen it on the internet, they've heard it on the 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock news. So the Tennessee, or, or all newspapers, major papers, have become basically just a, a rewrite, after they rewrite, warm leftovers from the 10 o'clock news on television or, mm -hmm. you know, what, whatever the leftovers were from the internet. And there's just not a reason. We're not giving, we, newspapers, are not giving the public a reason to, to pick up a paper and look at it. Mm -hmm. Again, there's no, it, it's simple, there's no news in the newspaper.